Upfront and Outspoken with Bob Williams. If you love the Constitution, man is not free unless government is limited. If you love freedom, as government expands, liberty contracts. If you believe in personal responsibility, if you believe America is still the greatest nation on earth, then get ready for an experience you'll never forget. This is Upfront and Outspoken. Here's your host, Bob Williams. And good Friday morning. This is Upfront Outspoken. Of course, I'm your host, Bob Williams. Glad to have you along with me today, especially today. Wow. I have something very, very special planned. But uh, before I bring my two guests on, I promised one guest I had a very special treat for him. I do. Uh, according to what sources have told me, and my sources is Paul Coleyban himself, is that today... Today is Australia Day. Now, I don't know what the hell that means. He's going to tell me himself. But, Paul, this one's for you. Australia! Australia! My country don't share no borders because of all the waters that surround our sands. Thank God for our resources because they are the sources of our wealth. See, I told you, Paul, I had something very special for you. All right, joining me now live from both somewhere in the outback and right there in Nashville, Tennessee, is Jimmy Parker and Paul Colivan and his lovely wife, Glenda. Hey, everybody, welcome. Good morning. I, I... <laughs> what happened, hey, Paul? Jimmy. Hey, Bob, how you doing? Well, uh, I'm... We're doing fine. <laughs> See, Paul, I told you I had something special for you. So tell me, what the hell is Australia Day? Uh, well, it's Monday. It's Australia Day, and it's the uh, landing of the, the whites in Australia, basically. It's when uh, we were sent over as convicts from England. So, you, so you're, a, you're a crook? Well, we're all crooks. It's just... Uh, <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> 
guys, I, it's a pleasure having you both. I, I know uh, th- this is this is a first for us, connecting two great uh, uh, friends. And, uh, you know, I once again, I want to welcome everybody on the show. Uh, Paul, you know, Jimmy, you know, you, there's a chance you're going to miss Paul, Glenda, uh, when they come here to the States. Why is that? I mean, come on. You guys no, are we, so close. We were, just, we were just talking before you went on the air, and they're going to be here in the last part of uh, May, early part of June. And I'm not booked out of town at that time because that's a CMA fest anyway. So I'll I'll be able to see them when they come over. So what what are you guys gonna do? You you you're gonna do like they uh, they do here in America? Have a uh, a barbecue? Have a few beers? Oh, kick back? I got what? a barbecue plan for them this time. <laughs> they, I, they had a barbecue last time. That was a weak one. I'm gonna have a good one for them this time. Now that was pretty cool, Jimmy. That was the first time I ever had a crow dad. <laughs> No, I've never had a crawdad myself. What the hell is it, actually? It's well, it's like a yabby. Yeah, it's it's almost like a miniature lobster. It's only about one inch long. It's a little. It's a. They call them mud bugs down in Louisiana because they get them out of the banks of the rivers and the swamps and everything. Ah. And they're really tasty. You only eat the tails on them, and they and and they look like a lobster, but it does. They're really just really really tiny and small. <laughs> and uh, their delicacy, you know, especially in the Cajun country, their delicacy. Now, and, um, the, the one ahead. one thing one thing I got to ask you: when you were down in Australia, Jimmy, what was the one delicacy that Paul shoved down you? <laughs> Cuban uh, cigars. Cuban cigars. That's right. That that was the delicacy over there. Um, they have they have some uh, great foods over there. They have a great cuisine. Um, I wasn't too keen on Vegemite. Uh, he, he tried to get me to eat a lot of that, but I, you know, he, after I got sick about five times on Vegemite, he stopped feeding it to me, but uh, no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> no, 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 we've no, but heard, I, you know, I enjoy it. Whenever I travel like that, I enjoy tasting different foods and all that. And, and they, you know, when I was at their house, they fixed up some nice dinners and everything too. And was just okay. enjoyable. Really enjoyable. No, no, Paul. Explain to my listeners. We we've heard veggie might, uh, you know, constantly that it's supposed to be some sort of a staple for Australia. Mm-hmm. What is veggie might exactly? It's horrible. Well, I don't <laughs> tell me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that crocodile Dundee thing. You know, you can eat it, but geez, it tastes like it doesn't taste good. <laughs> Like marmite. Yeah, marmite. You know, it's just a, it's just a uh, vegetable extract that yes. yeast that. Uh, yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> uh, don't send it my way. Don't send it my way. <laughs> no, I, I say to Jimmy when uh, when we get over there, we're uh, just booking our tickets tonight, so we'll be uh, we'll be heading over in late May to. And if we don't catch up with Jimmy, we'll hunt him down anyway and uh, <laughs> do some playing with him. But uh, we just booking our tickets then so uh we're talking about coming up to oklahoma we're uh, trying to look for some shows in oklahoma so we'll uh we'll bring some vegemite with us oh no 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 you can keep it if, if it's please anything do, if it, please do. If bob it, bob you got to try vegemite one time in your life one time if it got you sick can you imagine what it's going to do to me well it didn't really get me sick but it's like paul says it it, it does taste horrible <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> now, i'll be communicated as an australian after saying that <laughs> oh yeah let's let's bring it here for everybody in america to uh, quote unquote enjoy yeah okay now you guys you guys travel together in australia Oh, on, on a bus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now now you, you you got to tell the listeners. You have got to tell the listeners, you know, some of that travel. Now, Jimmy, you've got your stories. Paul, you've got your stories. So whoever wants Yo, to Jimmy's start. got his story, and I've got the truth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, start it, let's start it out with this. Up. I was set up the day I got there. I can tell you that. I was set up. I walked out of the airport, and it took me two hours just to get through customs. And Paul told me, he said, oh, I thought you were gone. I didn't know you were coming in and out. We were getting ready to leave. But um, anyway, it goes. I got through customs. I we left Paul. twice. Yeah. And I saw him with uh, a guy. and it, uh, That was the first time I'd seen this guy. His name was um, Michael Davis. He's the drummer for Paul's band, Born and Bred. Well, those two, they walked with me outside. And as soon as we walked out the door, the heat 
hit me. And it was, I forget what Paul said it was, but in degrees, it was something like, what, 105, Paul, something like that? Yeah, it was pretty hot. It was a hot yeah. day. But here's how I knew I was set up. They walked with me to the car, opened the trunk, and I put the put my luggage in the back in the trunk. And uh, they said, well, go have a seat, Jimmy. And so I walked around to the side of the car there on the passenger side and opened the door, and there was a steering wheel right there on the passenger side. Don't you just love it that they drive on the wrong side of the road? I'm telling you, everything was backwards. Over there. <laughs> <laughs> When are you guys going to get it? A- right then, I said, okay, I'm in for the time of my life here because they, they they got me on the. They were, both of them, Michael and Paul, were standing by the car laughing their tails off at me because I was getting in on the driver's side. <laughs> when, when are you guys going to get it right, Paul? You drive on the, the right side of the road, not the left <laughs> side. I mean, come on. Yeah, we got uh, Glenn and myself, we got. Nearly, we nearly got run over a thousand times cr- trying to cross the road in uh, Nashville, and we finally got used to looking the right way, looking to the left, and uh, before we crossed the road, we got back to Australia, and I nearly got hit by a bus when, at the uh, <laughs> at the airport. Walked out, <laughs> nearly, yeah, nearly got run over by a bus. <laughs> now, what what uh, uh, on this trip? Uh, you guys had some really really unusual uh, uh, incidents happen. If, if if memory serves me correctly, and correct me if I'm mistaken here, something about air conditioning didn't work. <laughs> no, it worked. It was just hot. <laughs> <laughs> we were, like we picked Jimmy up from the airport. He uh, he was with like. Jimmy was a great, uh, great passenger and a great person to travel with. And, you know, one thing that uh, we've learned over the years and we've been told over the years is uh, you don't play with people, you travel with people. And Jimmy was, you know, he's a great guy to travel with, great guy to play with. He did do some whinging uh, or complaining. <laughs> he got off the plane. He'd been on the plane for 30 hours and because uh, he got the milk run over here. Mm-hmm. And... Um, he was complaining about spending 30 hours on a plane and we picked him up in the bus and just went, man, 30 hours is nothing. We've got about 35 to go and it's uh, 120 degrees. And the air conditioning stopped working and uh, we were riding with all the windows down. Oh, no. And the engine compartment was inside the bus too, so we were getting heat from that. Oh, <laughs> was, but... What was it, Paul? But something started happening. It, it was like cutting out. So uh, Paul said, oh, my gosh, what is that? What is that? What's going on? I said, um, I'm sitting in the passenger seat. And uh, I said, sound like the fuel filter to me. Paul says, I, I, I don't know, Jimmy. I'm not sure. I don't know what it is. It's, it's got to be something. I think maybe the gas line or something. I don't know. I, I forgot what you said it, you thought it was, Paul. But he, he stopped the bus on that trip in the dead of night about three times and while you smoke cubans yeah i would sit back and smoke a cigar watching him under the bus working on it and um he had got me some cuban cigars over there you don't get them in america well at least not yeah we'll be getting them soon (laughs) maybe (laughs) maybe yeah may 28 (laughs) but but i was i would sit back and, and chill out while he was under the bus sweating and working on it and you were yelling everything out instructions. He, every, yeah, I was yelling out instructions and all that. And every time he would fix it, we'd get back in the bus and go. Nothing happened. It, it, it would start doing it again. Finally, I said, Paul, I think it's your fuel filter. So we took the fuel filter out. And didn't you buy one, Paul? Stop somewhere and buy one? No, we cleaned it out at 5 o'clock in the morning on the yeah, side we, of the road. And me being a diesel mechanic, it was really hard to admit that he was right, too. <laughs> But it's, finally, he cleaned the fuel filter out, and the thing worked perfect the rest of the trip. So, so, so here you are, Paul. You've got you've got Jimmy over there, and an American telling you how to fix your bus. What the hell? Yeah, it was uh, it was a long trip. A uh, I'll, long I'll bet trip. he didn't let you live that down for a while, did he? Nah, well, he still hasn't. It's been two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, what, no, all he wanted to do, uh, all Jimmy what, wanted to do was uh, see a kangaroo. And, yeah, uh, and was, now, here's what they would do to me on the bus. It was being at nighttime, him and Nick uh, Economo, the uh, bass player, 
which would, I, when I wanted to go to sleep, I'd move to the back of the bus and lay down on a seat and start sleeping. And all of a sudden, both of them, were, there's one over there. There's one over there. And I'd wake up looking for the kangaroo. So we passed it, Jimmy. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So I'd go back to sleep. There's one over there. I see one. I see one, Paul. I'd get, wake up and look. No kangaroo. They were fooling me the whole ride. They wouldn't let me sleep. No, because it was yep. So you nah, never... we weren't. They were dancing. As soon as you went to, as soon as you went to sleep, they were dancing down the side of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> we're just talking about that the other day because I put a new uh, put a new rhubarb on the front of the bus. And uh, we're thinking, of, thinking about when uh, every time you went to sleep, that's when the kangaroos come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like they're night owls, huh? No, I just didn't like Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna pause for a second. I want to get a song here uh, of Jimmy's. Yes, Paul, we've got one of yours. Uh, but I want to get uh, after this song, and, and I know we're gonna have more fun with this because I am going. To, it's gonna be a blast. Now, Jimmy, I know you wanted me to play one song. I had to because, well, I'll let you all decide for yourself. We'll be right back. Good morning, Nashville. Wildman here with your WJP Storm Center forecast. Today, mostly cloudy with 90% chance of rain. Highs around 63, low in the upper 30s. Wind gusts up to 30 miles per hour. So hold on to your hat and keep that umbrella handy. And now, back to the music. be raining when I raise my head Thunderstorms could be rolling in out of the west Every once in a while Gotta find higher ground Well, the man might be calling for a real bad day Can't get there from here You gotta find another way Times get tough Come one may More than you know I'll always love you More than you know I'll always want to hold you Got a lifetime of loving baby Right here in my arms More than you know I'll always need you More than you know A look that everyone can see She's got a lot of love And needs one for me That girl, she loves me She always could I stand a little bit taller Than I used to these days She's helped me dig down deep And find the strength To change what I can Accept what I came More than you know I'll always love you More than you know I'll always want to hold you Got a lifetime of loving baby Right here in my arms More than you know I'll always need you More than you know Than you know, I'll always love you 
you get to know anyone. And that's, uh, that, uh, guys, what can I tell you? That's Jimmy Parker and more than you will know. Uh, Paul, I got a question to ask you. Do you think uh, uh, Jimmy should keep his day job or become a DJ? I reckon he should stick with the music. <laughs> how pure, how pure. <laughs> How pure is that voice? That's uh, He's got a voice and a half on him, Jimmy. It was one of the things that uh, touring around with Jimmy, whether it was in Australia or in the States, we had, we had front row seats to uh, a voice like that every night, and it was, uh, it was pretty cool to sit around and just listen to it. You know, it's, like funny how, it's funny how uh, traditional country music that, uh, you know, and Jimmy is, you know, he's, he's one of the pure country music artists and we're sort of we're sort of more of a, uh, a a rocky or edgy sort of sort of country but it was just nice to have a, a contrast of traditional and um rock rocky sort of or edgy sort of country and people appreciate both and what we found was our music complemented jimmy and jimmy's yeah, music complemented us so it was just nice to have no uh, modern country versus uh, traditional country. It was just, it's just all country. One of the best things that we had, remember the finale, Jimmy at Bendemir, where we we got up and played Jimmy, um, Johnny Cash? Yes. Johnny yes. Cash numbers. I'll never, you know? forget, I'll never forget those shows. I'm telling you, they'll always well, be in my memory. Well, tell me, tell me what one of the experiences was when uh, you guys got up there and you, and you were singing uh, jointly. Uh, like you said, you you both got up and sang a little bit about Johnny Cash. What what kind of, you know give give the audience uh, uh, an overview, so to speak, or a feel of what was going on. Well, it was basically the last show of the series that we were doing, and uh, it was on stage in uh, Bendemir, and uh, that was what is that about forty miles outside of Tamworth, Paul. No, nah, 40 K is about 20 mile, yeah. 20, 20 miles. Um, Seemed yeah, like 40 mile in the bus. We had shows in Bandemir, but we would also go into Tamworth to see some of the other bands and all during that big music festival that they have in January. But um, anyway, the, the last show, we decided we were going to do our things. And then at the end, I think it was in the end of my show that uh, Paul and Glenda and uh, Isabel and Cody all walked up with the band and that we all just got to singing i think uh, paul and i did uh, uh ring of fire together and then we did another song i think when to, where everybody just sang together i forget what the name of it was now but uh it was just so cool being on stage with uh people on the other side of the world and we were all coming together singing music together you know the thing is is everybody says music is a as a universal language exactly and and, and glenda I, I you know i know i i know you're in the background you've been very quiet you know very uh subdued which is not normally the case from my understanding you know but <laughs> but i want to get a word I, in with those two boys yeah i want to know what it was like traveling with these two guys uh yeah. <laughs> oh, you nice guys are in trouble nice. now. I, I think I got you both in trouble. Go ahead, Glenda. Tell us what what was it like? No, it was fun. It was really fun. I had I had an absolute ball. It was very hot, and uh, Jimmy wasn't exaggerating when he said it was 105, 110 degrees. In fact, I had to stop get them to stop the bus one morning so I could get out, and I was feeling very nauseous because of the heat. Um, but we had an absolute ball. Everybody, where we went, everybody loved Jimmy and his music, and um, we had such a great time. I can't wait to go go back and us get to play together again. You know, the thing is, is when we, when I first uh, had the chance of listening to Paul's music, you know, which now seems eons ago, and uh, you know, you know, uh, it, it was just the idea that your music, which you call Red Dirt, is has taken off so much on our station and our network you know uh, it is a delight to always get a chance to talk to uh, you and uh, paul and this is a very this is a treat for me getting both of uh, my my close friends together jimmy you know uh, once again I, you know you've been with with this network just about as long um you know i i, I kind of 
I kind of get the impression that you guys are more than just merely, you know, okay, we're, we're uh, associates, we're more, you know, more like a kin. Uh, how close am I to say that? Well, on my end, I look at Paul as my brother. Um, it, we got really close when I went over there, and he treated me like family. Uh, he didn't treat me as a guest. He said, all right, Jimmy, he said, here's the bathroom, here's your, here's your bed, make yourself at home. And, and you know, from that point on... Didn't have to tell you twice. Didn't have to tell me twice, no. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and he, he, both of them, Glenda and Paul, and, and I'll even say Michael and um, Greta and Nick and everybody else that I met over there, just treated me like family. And that was so special to me. I'll never, ever forget being over there and meeting all those great people. But, but Paul, I love you, man. You're, you're like my brother. And, I, you know, nobody better ever say anything bad about you because I'll be right there to defend you, brother. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Sick him, Jimmy. Sick him. <laughs> yeah, J J Jimmy's closer, so I gotta watch out. I mean, he's only what about maybe four or five hundred miles from me. Okay, I, I I'll, I'll mind my p's and q's this time. <laughs> yeah, I uh, suppose what we've got in Australia, we um, we got mates, and you can uh, you can you just get your family, you choose your mates, and mates are forever. And uh, Jimmy's a mate. A true, a true mate. Not only to me, but to to Glenda as well. Jimmy's he's our mate, isn't he? Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa! We got a little hesitation there. Whoa, 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 whoa! whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's just teasing Jimmy. <laughs> now, well, I, I do love you, Glenda. You're my sister. <laughs> I, I think he's covering his ass, Glenda. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> You want it, Jimmy? I've seen a fight. <laughs> I'll get off my broom. <laughs> Ooh! Oh! 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 oh, oh. Uh, uh, was she going to be another Samantha Stevens here that oh, we yeah, don't know? That happened when I was over there, man. Uh, she was asking Paul to buy her a car. He said, "She said, Paul, I need to get around. I need something to drive." So Paul came back from the store with a broom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't think, Glenda, that was what you had intended, was it? <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break here. I, I, we're gonna uh, play a song here uh, that has is probably the most requested Australian song we have. It's by Born and Bred. I'm sure Paul probably already knows. It. He's probably sick of hearing it, but you aren't. Here is Born and Bred and the Kellys. Woohoo! <laughs> And tired, restless. And one day he up and left. Died of typhoid fever in the gold fields in the west. Someone built a statue on the spot, up burned down. Nothing much has happened since the Kellys came to town Nothing much has happened since the Kellys came to town Cause like a burst of thunder the rut in from the bush The vandalized the telegraph Shot the law to And then that mongrel Cun out Snuck out and raised a stink There was horse racing And there was dancing And grog brought a drink Show who used to entertain Down in the eucalypts Married now and weighs in a twelve stone and a slip. And all those Argus headlines have turned to musty brown. And nothing much has happened since the Kellys came to town. And nothing much has happened since the Kellys. Came to town. Just like a burst of thunder, the red end from the tours. They robbed the National Bank to a lab round 
the force And then that flame and Johnson He set the pub on fire We had ourselves the biggest party in the history of this shire Just like a burst of thunder the road and from the camp The skin Delighted all the trance And then that bloody blue coat He shot Kelly in the leg We had ourselves a taste Of the lies we might have led We had ourselves a taste Of the lies And that is The Kellys by my guest, Paul Coley Van. Of course, you heard earlier, Jimmy Parker, and Jimmy is with us as well. Once again, welcome back, everybody. You know, I want to ask you, Jimmy, one thing before we get into, uh, you know, a lot of other stuff. Uh, you know, I, I think we're going to be running over here. But what is, you know, your trip to Australia, what is the one thing, and I, I know you're going to have a lot of great memories but what is the one thing about Australia it's, uh, and its people that stand out the most to you? If you don't mention me, I'll kill you. <laughs> the, the uniqueness of it, um, as many similarities as it has to the United States, it's also a lot of other things that aren't like the United States. Um, it, it's a very unique um, uh, landscape to it. Uh, it's a very unique cuisine um, it's, uh, the, the people are even in their own right a unique, new, unique type of people. And uh, but yet we all worship the same thing together, and that's freedom. And um, you know, if I was, if I couldn't live in the United States, I would want to live in Australia because it would feel more like home to me, and and than any other place I've ever been. And that's that's one thing I will never ever forget, is the feeling of home being over there and i think a lot of it had to do with the people that i was hanging around with uh they made me feel at home now paul you've been in the united states yourself uh prior you know previously the, this trip that's coming up here in the end of may what's the one thing about the united states that stands out most to you i suppose glenda and myself with every trip that we've had we've come back and like um like Jimmy's experiences over here and they're vice versa, you know, like Jimmy treated us like a god when we were over there too, you know, so um, having mates over there is pretty cool and, you know, we, we love Jimmy and uh, a bunch of guys in Alabama, you know, so, but the thing that we walked out of leaving America, we went, it's the people, it's... The worst American we we met was fantastic. So it was it was just the people we we were made feel uh, feel at home. You know, we just we just fitted in. It was just one of those things that uh, just the people, just how welcoming the people are. That's 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 what we walked away with. You know, the, by the sound of with with you two talking about each other, do you think the Pope is going to put you on sainthood? I mean, my God. <laughs> I don't know if we'll get that close or not. <laughs> Mind you, I have, I have performed some miracles, Jimmy. <laughs> well, we all have. I, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, in, in one aspect or another, I think we all have at one time or another. Uh, but, the, the, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, you guys are so close. I mean, you are a family, indeed a family, not only joined by music, but you can just sense it by talking to you both. And it's always a pleasure having you guys on. And I, we got to do this again. We, we can't let this go without. Uh, now, Paul, you're coming here to the United States the end of May. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Where is, uh, you know, where are some of the venues you're going to be at? Uh, Callington, Oklahoma. Yeah, he's going to be right here in the studio, folks, and I'm, I'm dreading this one. This is going to be crazy. You know what? I've got to come down. I've got to come for that. Uh oh! Hey Jimmy, what? Why don't we just 
jump in the car and go to go to Oklahoma. That's what we should do, Paul. You, I should do have you think I'm gonna get you? Road. You think my studio? A road trip. A road trip. And we'll, you know. You, you honestly just think? Just go and yeah. uh, go to Callington and we'll, we'll play somewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, as far as Calton goes, we'll probably have to go down on the street and sit with our guitar cases open and play for tips, but hey, we can do it. <laughs> you want to know something? If you, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you both something. You come here to Callington and play, you're only going to be playing to 179 people in a big mouth. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Salisaw, of course, well, that's a little ways away. But anyhow, guys, you know, it's going to be fun. Uh, I'm looking forward to personally meeting both of you. If you decide to come here to the studios, I'll, I'll have to knock out a wall, but we'll get you all in in here but you know the the thing i i've always been fascinated about is that there is indeed there is indeed a camaraderie when it comes to country and western music and even though even though uh jimmy you play more you have more of a classical style of country and paul has gone more to what paul refers to as red dirt country Red, they're, they're, the edgy type. Yeah, right. the the edgy. It's only because I can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of doubt that one, but you know, uh, the thing is, is you know, I want to get your impressions of how universally people are actually taking to country music today. And I'm going to start out with with Paul first. Uh, universally, I I think we're. Um we're a bit uh, backward, or well, not backward, but uh, we're a bit isolated here with what we call country, and it's it's only traditional country music is what Australians call country. Where in the states, you guys sort of have a much uh, broader interpretation of what country music is. Maybe it's too broad. Maybe it's you know I don't know. I, I'm not going to comment on that, but. Um, the here in Australia, it's it's very traditional. What is country, and uh, in the states, it's yeah, it's a broader, broader, broader spectrum, and we sort of fit into that broader side of things, I suppose. So, but the, at the end of the day, it's about selling a story or, or telling a story, and um, doing it tunefully. And if it hasn't got a story, then it's not country music whether it's like we might be edgier but it's still a story we're telling stories about our grandfathers or our uh our upbringing whatever it is it's still a story and that's that's what country music's about it's about bringing people together and connecting with a story rather than hey baby 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 that's that's not music to me so it's about selling a story so country music is getting a bigger and better following because it has a purpose rather than just a tune. All right, Jimmy, Pretty now your turn. Well, I think country music, for one thing, is the type of music that when you become loyal to it, you stay with it. Um, I've never seen as many loyal fans as the ones that I have, for instance. Um, they're on my Facebook page. They go to my website. They share my music, and they stay with me. Um, you know, the, the the country music fan base is one of the most loyal bases in the music business. Um, once people grab on to you, they're there for the rest of your life or the rest of your career, as, as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you don't see that too much with other genres. Um, there are, you know, your rock fans and so forth, and... And all, but rock music has changed over the years, and, and and all too, and even with pop music, pop music is geared more towards a younger generation, who are sometimes, and I'm not saying all of them are, but some of them are a little fickle, and they may like this person today, and then two years down the road they'll like somebody else. They're they're jumping from bandwagon to bandwagon. But the country music fan, the loyal country music fan, especially in the traditional country music arena, uh, they are some of the most loyal fans you will ever find. Now, the music itself is just like Paul said. Country music is a story, and it comes from the heart. It doesn't come from just out of nowhere. Uh, if, if a singer usually sings in country music, especially, and, and this is the way I approach it, I want to sing something that I have lived and experienced or I know somebody that has lived and experienced it. If I can get those two things in a song, then when I when I sing it, I can portray it, and what I'm feeling will 
uh, transposed over to the person listening to it, and hopefully they can feel it from the heart too. But that's that's the big thing about country music. I just love the storytelling that that it is. I I try to find songs that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, I think that's what that you know you you said you summed it up very good, Jimmy. Because uh, country music, uh, da, it is storytelling and even you know in australia with paul and uh, and glenda doing uh, the kelly's it is indeed a story in in and of itself along with mm-hmm. some great music now the question uh i have and uh the, you know it, it, sometimes it, you know, I, I seem to rub people the wrong way but i hope i don't is that you know it, you both are independent artists and i know it's got to be difficult uh you know making uh so to speak ends meet you know especially in a very uh specific genre of music now paul in australia it's got to be even harder than it is here in the united states am i right or am i wrong in that look yeah it's it's a hard struggle for a lot of um artists in australia it's a you know it's a uh, smaller community Basically, like we've got, um, there's less people in Australia than there is in Texas, and it's the size of the US. So, as Jimmy knows, you know, you can spend 30 hours in a bus and you're only half halfway across the country. So, there's a lot of, tra- then there's only, uh, what, five major cities in Australia. So, there's a, uh, there's a lot of traveling involved for a lot of these artists. There's... Like I said, as many people living in Australia as there is in Texas, but it seems like Australians don't spend money on music like Americans do too. So it is a hard struggle. But and look, hats off to the people that um, that do keep um, being dedicated to what they do. So they've got a they, you know they've got a hard hard slog ahead of them. It seems like. Um, it's not easier, but it's it's certainly not easier in the states. Like the, the quality of player in in America, that's what blew us away when uh, we when we first went to America was um, just how professional, how the standard of the, the player was so high. And basically, we had to come home and regroup and get better at what we did before we went back the next time. And the next time we went went back to the states we had to come home and get better again and i don't think that stops so not that it's easier in the states but it's the opportunities for uh, playing country music are greater in america i suppose so that's why we come back because the people enjoy what we do and if people enjoy enjoy what we do we enjoy it more now and, do- you know that's I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I want to get I want to get Jimmy's impression here. When you played the venues in Australia, uh, would and I know you played several venues here in the states. Would in a in a kind of a quick comparison, were the Australian audiences, um, you know, did they like that seem to like the music more than here in the United States, or were they? you know basically the same i mean you're you're talking a smaller country here yes it was basically i found the same in 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 one regards as everybody would sit and listen see country music is one thing you can dance to it if you want to but it's also the kind of music that you sometimes just want to sit and listen to because it touches you and i found a lot of that over there people mostly would sit and listen and and when you're an entertainer and you're looking out in the audience and you get once you get to the part where you're comfortable and you're not nervous and you're wide-eyed and scared like a deer in front of headlights you sometimes look at the audience and you can tell if someone is into what you're doing or not and i I would look out into the audiences that we played for and i could I, i make eye contact with some and i would sing to them and they're right there with me I could look in the back of the audience. They're right there with me. And um, I'm not sure if it was the um, fact that um, I was an American over in their country and they were uh, curious and they were uh, wanted to see what was going on with, with how, you know, the singing part of it and all that. It could have been that too. 
but um, I, I found all the audiences, and especially in Tamworth, and Paul can tell you this, Tamworth, during the music festival over there, when they have country music, it's uh, they are country music fans. Right, Paul? Oh, yeah, they're, they're there for one thing and one thing only, and that's to listen to country music. Exactly. I mean, and, and every place and you go in. a million in, people there. Yes. Every place you go in is packed. And most of them don't even treat them as bar rooms anymore. You go in, they got a bar and everything, but they've taken everything out and put nothing but chairs in there. And I was so surprised because the people were actually sitting and listening and all these uh, unknowns and people who had gigs over there were like in concert atmosphere more than it was in a barroom atmosphere. Well, and a barroom, was- Jimmy, you could take your own beer in. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I like to see you try doing that in some of the places around here. You'd get kicked out quicker, and you know what? I, yeah. You know, the, the, thing, the thing is, is music, you know, we all seem to miss the... The true essence of music, as a as, as like I said earlier, is a universal language, mm-hmm. and and I have to commend you both for bringing great music to the forefront. I just wish there was more that we could do. Um, you know, well, you know, being an independent artist is, is is two things. One, you're your own promoter, and one, your own your your own financier. And as long as you got fans that are buying you albums support you at shows or in my case like i'm doing i'm making it off of um house concerts people ha- get you to come in to do house concerts and so forth as long as you can do that you can continue to put out your music but uh it's it's, it's tough and it's not easy um you know it's labels here in town that could make things easier for people like myself or paul but um for some reason they just it just doesn't happen that way anymore and um and i think i do this because i love it i do it because i love to sing and i love to entertain and it doesn't matter to me if i make 50 dollars tonight or 200 tomorrow night it doesn't matter as long as i enjoy it and i'll sing for two people and i'll give them the same kind of performance as i would give five thousand now, Paul, would would you agree with uh, Jimmy's analysis of it that this is a uh, you know doing music, you know creating great music such as you you do, <laughs> is it indeed Thank you. Uh, is it indeed a love more than it is a necessity to make money? Well, it's, uh, if I was if I was going to make money out of music, I'd sell all my gear. It's about the only way I'd make money out of it. <laughs> So but, uh, yeah, it's certainly not the money. It's 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 like a hobby that's um, self sustainable, and it's like, it's like playing golf. You know, you, people spend a lot of money on golf, or uh, playing poker, or you know, playing bowls, or whatever. You know, it's it's something they love doing, and the it, the money doesn't really come into it. It's, if you make some money out of it, well, that's great. It's more about selling the stories. It's more about uh-huh. playing with people that have the same sort of love i suppose you know we jimmy and myself and glenn went down to uh, alabama to tuscaloosa to play with a band called who shot lizzie and those guys were a scream they just love what they love doing what they do and that was a bit of an eye-opener for us as well you know just how much they got off on um doing what they do and as I said, you know, I, I've got front row seats to... I'm, I'm sitting in front of one of the best bands kicking around. I get to hear some of the best songs that uh, I've heard written. Glenda just wrote something the other day called Salt is for Sorrow. And it was a... I asked her where the saying come from, and it was from a grandmother. Cause it, uh, salt is for Sorrow meant... That it was sad, yeah? Yeah, so... And she wrote this song, and it... It, uh, it's evolved into one of the better songs that, we've, that we're doing at the moment. And all I do is play a couple of chords and um, hide in the background and pretend I'm doing harmonies, you know. But I get to sit front row seats listening to a fantastic song surrounded by a bunch of really, really good musicians. No, I no. get the opportunity to go to America and play with people like Jimmy and Who Shot Lizzie and those guys, you know. Like, as far as... a a um a love or a hobby 
I suppose you'd have to call it a hobby because you know if you get money out of it, then that's great. But it's I, I got I got the best seats in the in the house. It is a profession in its own right, but if you're in it for the money, you're in it for the wrong reason. Exactly, Jimmy. Exactly. You know, and the thing like is, I, I played golf for a living, and I was a professional golfer, but I didn't make any money, so I wasn't real professional at it. Mm -hmm. A musician, I like this kind of saying like this, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't quote it for word for word, but a musician is a person who will spend $1,000 for a guitar, $2,000 for a PA system, get in his car and drive 500 miles, pay for all the gas and the food to work a $100 a night gig, and then come back home. That's a heck of a And feel good about it. And feel good about it. Right. Fill a million bucks. <laughs> and fill a million bucks. That's yep. true. You know, that's kind of like me. I mean, I, I love what I do. I love, especially when I get guys like you on here, but uh, the pay sucks. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 you know I, I tell everybody, when I was teaching school, I would tell my students, I said, for God's sakes, don't ever go into something for money. I said, find something that you love to do do and it will never ever be work and it never ever will be a job to you and if you love it that much the money will take care of itself i i guess that's why i'm in this business 30 plus years and counting <laughs> mm -hmm. i i love it i mean you guys are right i mean if you if you love something so much it it makes absolutely no difference if you make one penny or a million dollars it it really makes no difference as long as you never oh, i'd make a bit of difference if i made a million bucks like <laughs> oh well yeah you who could probably like up, that yeah, I mean, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Well, million where million are we dollars? going jimmy <laughs> just got a mil i'd be in <laughs> australia bucks. every january if i had a million dollars <laughs> yeah i get that air conditioning and fix. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Now we only got. Hey, a we've only got a couple. On one of thing, Bob. Just one thing. Yeah. Go ahead. I saw. I saw that um, the uh, the donation thing on the the uh, radio station. You need some. Uh, you need some cash to survive. I think uh, I, I'm going to foot the bill there if uh, other people can get behind it. I think this is the sort of thing that independent artists or you know just any artist. You support me, I'll support you. So, if I'll, uh, I'll put some bucks up. If other people put some bucks up, so we need to get that uh, that donation thing happening to uh, ram it home. So we've still got an avenue to do this sort of stuff. I, I you know what, what the the irony put to that, Paul. You know, and I'm going to be honest with with everybody out there, all of our listeners across the globe. I'm going to tell you something. No matter what. No matter what, if we raise $1, 1000 whatever, no matter what, we are going to stay on the air because it is guys like these that we highlight every single chance we get because independent artists, I don't care who you are, where you are, what type of music you listen to, independent artists are the backbone of the entire music industry. And for that, you know, we... My hat is off to both these guys because, uh, you know, they do such a great job. Now, Glenda, I want to ask you one more question before we go off the air. You, you're just writing another, you're just writing a beautiful song. When do we get it here at our studios? Oh, I think when we come over and see you, we'll have it ready. I can't get a sneak peek? Come on. <laughs> Jeez, you see this. This is what I go through, folks. You know. Come on, Glenda, sing a little bit of it to him with that beautiful voice you got. Come on. <laughs> it's a good song, but I sing it, Jimmy. She wrote it. I sing it. Oh, we well, didn't. Well, she ought to sing it though. You know, oh. she, I mean, come on. I mean, she, no, I wrote it for Paul to sing. Ah, this is going to be fun. So mm -hmm. this is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to this. Paul's got that that edgy, edgy voice, and I like that. And Glenda, you know your song "White Lies," uh, you know which I didn't get a chance to air here, is also a very beautiful song. Now, Paul, before we go off the air, how can people go about and hear your music, download it, buy it, whatever? And then Jimmy, I'm going to ask you the same thing. But Paul, go ahead first. Easiest way: Google "Born and Bred Red Dirt." Just search Born and Bred Red Dirt. All right, Jimmy, your shot. 
All right, they can get me on uh, www.jimmyparkermusic.com. That's my official website, jimmyparkermusic.com. Um, they can also find me on cdbaby.com. If you go to there, just put in a search bar for an artist, Jimmy Parker. And they can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Parker's Jukebox. And I would like to say one more thing. Bob, ask me how hot was it in <laughs> Australia? All right. All right. You got me. How hot? I'm telling you the truth on this. When I took a shower over there, I didn't even have to cut the hot water on. <laughs> That's hot. That's hot. <laughs> and then he walked out of there whinging and warning how hot it was. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to ask you all to hold tight, everybody else. It's time for me to get out of here. Stay tuned, because coming up right after NPR News, the one, the only, Ed Till will be joining you all the way to 4 o'clock. Until Monday, 6 a.m., this is Bob Williams. Take care of yourselves.